Beautiful. Well, we are very glad today to um, have our next careers and peace building conversation with John K. Matsuoka, um, who has had already a long illustrious career in Academy Philanthropy and now working at a Buddhist Temple. Um, the Hongpa Hongwanji Hawaii Betsuin is um, the main temple of the Hongpa Hongwanji Mission of Hawaii. Um, these um, uh, the Betsuin and, and Hawaii Kyodan belong to the Jodo Shinsu, uh, the Shin Buddhism school, and maintain close ties with the Nishi Hongwanji head temple in Kyoto. Um, there are th 34 temples um, in total, and really the mission of the temple is to share the living teachings of uh, Buddhism so that all beings enjoy harmony, peace, gratitude. Now I met uh, John Matsuoka uh, because he is working to build a larger sense of family and community at the Betsuin. He seeks to um, build bridges and to open the doors to um, young people, multiple generations, uh, people of varying and various um, socioeconomic backgrounds and uh, cultural orientations. And his inclusive and expansive vision and hope for the Betsuin was very compelling to me. So we talk story and shared ideas. And I think that you'll enjoy hearing from him today uh, about um, his efforts, but also about how we can build community and even in our interfaith endeavors, learn to create family that is grounded in community wellness, a spiritual um, equanimity, and uh, deep personal peace, um, as well as, uh, you know, so find our professional pathways. So I don't want to delay any longer. I'd like to invite John to come and share some initial thoughts, and then I will ask a few questions. I also invite you in the audience to please uh, put your questions in the chat. Um, preliminarily, I'd like to share that you are coming from Kona, from Palolo, uh, from downtown Oahu, from Mililani, from Wahiwa, and from Dunedin, Aotearoa. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for those of you who didn't share your earth, but who are joining us from your respective places. And John, I hand it over to you. Well, thank, thank you so much, Maya and Jose, for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here and, and to uh, share my stories and my mana'o. Um, I, I, first, first thing I want to do is acknowledge an old friend of mine who recently passed, um, Bruce Barnes, who was with the Matsunaga Peace Institute in Conflict Resolution. And uh, he's somebody, when I was at UH, that I work with from time to time, uh, he was he was um, involved in the mediation with students, but I also knew him socially. And we would get together every couple of months and we would have a paina of Hawaiian music and hula. And, and uh, Bruce was quite an accomplished uh, slack key guitarist. And anyway, he, he is a wonderful human being, big heart, uh, very humble. And uh, his celebration of life is tomorrow. So I just I just wanted to acknowledge Bruce. Um, so thank you, Maya, for providing me questions. And uh, please, if I go on too long, stop me. And, and I really want to encourage participation and, and dialogue. Um, so the first question that, that Maya asked me uh, to talk about was kind of my background and how I came to this place. And uh, so let me touch on that. Um, I am what you call a katonk. I'm Japanese, <laughs> born uh, in California. I'm not, I wasn't born and raised in Hawaii. I was born and raised in LA, in uh, South LA in the Crenshaw District. And um, which kind of uh, suggests that maybe I had a different set of experiences growing up and I was socialized in a different way. Crenshaw is uh, kind of a 
well known for being the largest African-American enclave west of Chicago. And uh, it was a very interesting place to grow up. It, it, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and um, there, there was uh, a lot that was happening, a very tumultuous time uh, in relation to civil rights. Uh, I was witness to, to a lot of social uh, upheaval uh, in a very tumultuous time when people were striving to address issues of, of social oppression. Um, you know, just, I grew up two blocks from Crenshaw Boulevard. And so I remember distinctly when the National Guard was lined up to, to go down this, the, the road to, to uh, quell the, the uh, upheaval that was occurring in Watts. And um, I, I remember uh, watching uh, on television when uh, Robert F. Kennedy was campaigning in LA and, and uh, you know, just on the verge of being elected president and, and then waking up the next morning to find out that he had been assassinated. So I guess the point being was that there were, there were a lot of things that were happening uh, in LA and somehow through osmosis or whatever, you kind of absorb these things and they, they really shape your, your orientation politically, socially, culturally. Um, I was, uh, because, um, you know, LA, actually at the time that I was growing up, at least in my younger years, it was very mixed ethnically. And it was, uh, uh, after the war, there were a lot of, uh, the Japanese were coming out of the concentration camps. And so my mother's side, um, uh, they were farming in, in, in a place called Vista, North of California. And they, they went off to post in Arizona, you know, just dispossessed of all, all the material wealth and, and sense of place and put in a concentration camp. And came back after the war, and and a lot of Japanese families were settling in the Crenshaw area. My father, ironically, was in the service in the military. He served in the military, and after the war, came back and and they got married and they settled in Crenshaw. A lot of uh, Japanese families were also settling in East LA. So the the there, there's this kind of, I, I guess people have kind of forgotten that, there, that, that the Asian community at one time was very close to the African-American community, as well as on the East side, very close to la, the Latino community. And so that was my experience growing up in, in a very multicultural environment. Um, at the same time, as big as LA is, um, it's very segregated. And uh, so I got bust from the South side from a very academically challenged uh, school, high school, to the West Side, to uh, you know, a very uh, high-performing uh, high school uh, that was predominantly Jewish American, and um, but it really opened up my world and exposed me to communities and culture that I had never imagined. And uh, as soon as I had choice over where I was going to live. I split LA and I went to a place called Humboldt uh, near the Oregon border because I wanted to study wildlife biology. Uh, I don't know where that came from. I grew up in the inner city, but I was always interested in in wildlife and and biology. And and um, during the course of my studies there, you know, again because of the times, um, switch from biology to uh, to social sciences. And that became my academic, uh, my academic direction from that point. Um, I so uh, basically, you know, which is kind of the you know the theme of my life, going going from uh, one place to a place that's very very different, and um, uh, just you know the, this this kind of culture shock of, of, of being an inner city kid to to being uh, you know going to a very a counterculture place that was in the Redwood Forest. Um, I, I went on to pursue uh, my education at University of Washington, then on to University of Michigan. And upon completing my graduate studies, got an offer uh, to come to Hawaii. And I was tired of the Midwest, tired of the, the uh, homogeneity of the Midwest, especially in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I thought Hawaii would be a good place to spend a, maybe a couple of years. And I took the job and I, I never left. That was back in 1985. Um, 
when I arrived in Hawaii, um, Hawaii was going through just this, this kind of radical economic shift from agriculture, agribusiness to tourism development. And I, you know, we had family ties to Hawaii, which is another reason why I came here. But, you know, I remember coming here as a child and it, it was just a, a, a very different place when I arrived in the mid 1980s where, where land was just being transformed from agricultural lands to tourism and to, to urban uh, uh, zoning. And it, um, you know, after doing some assessment, realizing that nobody's really looking at it. How is it affecting communities? How is it affecting culture? And so I kind of delved into that area as a program of research, and I started working with uh, other people on campus, uh, Daviana McGregor, uh, Hawaiian historian in ethnic studies, and Luciano Minerbi, uh, professor in urban and regional planning. And we began to work together, and we worked together for the next 25 years doing research on the impacts of development on local communities, primarily native Hawaiian communities in rural areas throughout the island. So I had this opportunity to travel throughout the islands and um, you know, from Milo'i to uh, uh, East Kauai and every place in between, we did some from uh, seminal work on the island of Molokai, uh, a big project that I did more on my own was on the island of Lanai, which was very significant because while I was there doing my work, I met and married a Kumuhula from the island of Lanai. And uh, we ended up settling in Papakolea. So that's where I've lived for the past 28 years or so. And, uh, you know, interestingly, Papakalea Hawaiian homestead is not that different from growing up in Crenshaw, the very ethnic enclave. And uh, despite its reputation, just a really wonderful place to live. Um, so, okay, anyway, I, I, I stayed in academe for, or at least as a professor for 15 years, and then had the opportunity to move into administration and became the Dean of the School of Social Work. And, um, that that uh i guess i'll talk a little bit about that um it seems like every place i've been um be it uh uh and the found consuelo foundation and now at the hawaii betsu in i've i've been placed in a situation where change at least in my opinion was required and uh organizations that were pretty stolid and and somewhat stagnant and maybe not really uh, reflective of place, uh, place being Hawaii, place being the Pacific, place being in the Asian Pacific region, and uh, really wanting to kind of move the, the institution to a, uh, to, rep it, to a place that represented the people in the land here. Uh, look, First things that we did uh, when I became dean was we renamed the school from the school uh, the school of social work to the Myron Pinky Thompson School of Social Work, and that was a major undertaking because when I approached the president of the university at the time, uh, he said it would cost twenty five million dollars to to name a school, and uh, but the, the suggestion actually wasn't didn't you know was not something that I came up with. Um, I had developed close ties to the, to the congressional delegation, and Senator Inouye was the one that proposed that we do that. Um, and anyway, we, we were able to do it, not, not because we came up with $25 million, but because the congressional delegation told the university that they needed to change the name. Uh, we established a, a, an online distance education program so that we offered our master's degree program to every island, or at least every county in Hawaii. Uh, a lot of people in rural areas were not, not able to like, um, you know, just stop life where they were and come to the Manoa campus. So we brought the program to them. We established a Native Hawaiian learning program that was funded by Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, we sponsored the first ever Global Indigenous Social Development Conference that was long overdue. And 500 people came mainly from the uh, Pacific region. Uh, it was a wonderful event. And from that, we were able to get funding to establish the Journal of Indigenous Social Development. Uh, uh, we established the Kupuna Council 
uh, for the school and uh, comprised of mainly alumni that uh, uh, people of Hawaiian descent that were had worked in the field for several decades, increased enrollment, brought in a lot of extra enrollment, all the things that we're supposed to do as, as an academic unit. Um, and then, and, but we also um, established partnerships with institutions throughout Pacific and Asia, Japan, Thailand, China, uh, and various places throughout the Pacific region. Um, so as an administrator, I don't know if I'd refer to myself as a peacemaker per se. I mean, I call it that. I, it depends on how you how you define peace, but the struggle it was uh, it was it was dealing with with uh, a lot of opposition. To any time you're in a ch in a change situation, people don't like change, P especially people that are uh, vested in the system, and, and they will fight you tooth and nail. Um, so some of the associated with that. Uh, UH is a very colonial institution. And there was a, there's a major disguise, you know, I, I don't want to say that I know UH now, but at least when I left in 2010, there's a major disconnect between upper administration and the local community. Uh, the powers that be at UH uh, give priority to certain departments and fields, while divesting in, in areas that it are inherently tied to the community. Um, sitting through Dean's meetings for, for 10 years, our, our benchmark institution was UC Berkeley. We aspired to be UC Berkeley as a, as a public institution with high academic uh, status, and uh, but very different from Hawaii. There, there, there is this kind of notion that uh, UH was a Hawaiian place of learning. Uh, perhaps we it's moved in that direction, but but it was a very fuzzy concept. Well, what is a Hawaiian place of learning? Um, also, uh, it was very focused on generating monetary resources, getting large contracts from the military. Uh, more recently, the TMT uh, thirteen meter telescope. Uh, so, and, and and garnering resources took priority over place-based relevance. Uh, they gave little, uh, they also gave very little support to economic diversification. They're the producing graduates um, that that really came into fields, in, including my own, that were, there weren't job opportunities. So they were uh, people that had really positive kind of pro-social ideologies were graduating and they didn't have options. So for example, graduates from uh, environmental uh, science in, in tropical agriculture that came in wanting to do agriculture were could only secure jobs in GMO fields and, and uh, uh, Monsanto and, and, and students that were graduating from Department of Urban and Regional Planning um, went in with very good intentions and could only secure jobs in engineering firms that were promoting development throughout the islands. Uh, so educational institution that could have, I, I thought, could have done a lot more in terms of, of you know, shaping the economy of Hawaii. Um, so some of my strategies uh, as an administrator was, uh, you know, as any good minority, uh, and I considered myself a good minority growing up the way I did, when the system blocks your path to success and viability, you find alternative routes. Um, you're not making it given the opportunities that are that are presented to you so you you, tr you try something different uh it's a really important to have a clear vision that's relevant to hawaii and the pacific region uh for us it was important to reject the ivory tower image and focus on professional and community needs and goals uh, we worked, as I alluded to, to indigenize our curriculum and create a community-based academy. Um, again, land-grant institution, we were obliged to, to, to support and fulfill our obligation to the people of Hawaii. Um, and getting back to creating your own route. So when we weren't getting funding or when we weren't high on the priority list, of UH as when they presented their budget to the state legislature, we went directly to the state legislature. We, we developed relationships 
very strong relationships with key legislators, the Speaker of the House, who actually ended up being on our board, as well as budget and finance people, and we were able to get funding from them. Uh, every time I, I was anywhere close to Washington, D.C., I stopped in D.C. and I met with all of our congressional people and developed relationships with uh, people in Congress, especially uh, Senator Inouye, who was the, the senior senator at the time. And uh, I remember one time he said, hey, you know, I'm going to put some people on your board and, uh, you know, very powerful brokers in Hawaii. And he did. And uh, so that was how we were able to uh, influence, um, you know, some of the uh, the flow of resources to our school, uh, including renaming our school. Um, doing outreach. Uh, to the uh, to the broader community to cultivate social and political capital, and and establish partnerships with key agencies and organizations, in, including foundations. We got a lot of support from from private sources as well. Um, and, and the key, I think, to garnering the resources out there uh, was to 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 share your vision. And to to uh, you know, and and if it made sense to people, people would buy into it. Um, when I became dean, the faculty power structure centered around long-term tenured senior white male professors with extensive records of scholarship, but meager ties to the community. And I quickly learned that people became emotionally violent when they felt that their vested interests were under siege or being threatened. And I learned quite a bit firsthand about the intolerant dimensions of white liberality. Um, so it's, it's, again, lessons learned. I think one must stand firm on their beliefs and vision, uh, keep critics at bay, never succumb to fear or threats, seek allies and build coalitions and be patient. Uh, ultimately, support materializes. Uh, Change, the other thing that I learned was change, change does not require consensus. It requires vanguards and critical mass. And I think all too often people make that mistake that you have to get everybody on board on the same page. And that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. But if you have people that are willing to take risks, that are willing to take the lead, and you have enough of a critical mass, then you can move forward with that. Uh, it's vitally important in this kind of work where there's a lot of conflict. Um, to um, establish balance between work and family, to keep a perspective and prioritize needs, to do enjoyable things and to spend time in nature, to always be strategic and selectively expend and place your energies, and to look at life uh, through a temporal lens, that everything is impermanent. And it's really important to, to, to know that and, and to think about that and to keep that in your conscious mind all the time. Uh, to believe in karma as I do uh, is to avoid being caught in, to, in the bluster of others. Um, organizational change is not for the faint hearted or the lukewarm. Organizational change is, is tough work. Um, anyway, that's some background and uh, my response to the first question. I'll, I'll pause. Yeah, well, there's so much in what you have just shared that uh, is valuable and relevant. I do think that you are a peace builder. I define peace and the Matsunaga Institute for Peace defines peace very, very broadly, right? And inclusive of many of the things that you have had to do in terms of bringing in voices that have not been valued or respected sufficiently or centered, um, really ensuring that um, there is justice and representation, building bridges, gathering people around uh, conflict and finding pathways forward, even if it's not 100% agreed upon those solutions um, have been nourished. I would say that the United States of America is, you know, a, a, you know, sort of noble experiment and project, right, in democracy. Um, but we can see there that 
uh, there is no tenable way to have perfect agreement on, on issues. And Hawaii is um, a powerful and complex uh, place of negotiation. And you, as someone coming from elsewhere, seeing the richness, the bounty, the beauty, connecting, braiding your lives with others, I think in ways that are conducive to to intimacy and connection uh, and deep respect have been really wonderful. You've listened uh, deeply and, and I think learned much and are bringing uh, people together today to uh, ensure that we are moving forward um, thoughtfully. You age at the time when you were striving, I think was not as much of a Hawaiian place of learning as it is now. I do think things have improved and it sounds like you were part of making those changes. You're right, uh, the universities are so inherently conservative sometimes. And I uh, see now that Ka'ivi uh, Puni Life, you know, Punihe is really responsible there for making um, it a place, Hope UH, a place of a Hawaiian place of learning for all. Um, how can Kanaka culture be instrumental uh, in forging peaceful pathways forward for everyone, um, regardless of their background? There's so much that Hawaii has to teach the rest of the continent, you know, the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And I see now that Kamuela Inos is part of the uh, Office of Indigenous Innovation and, you know, in many ways, and the work, of course, of John Osorio and, and his Ohana really have made the University of Hawaii more Hawaiian, but there's still a long way to go and a long journey. I wanted to ask you to please share now your hopes for the Betsuin and your current efforts. And please also share with uh, the group what you shared with me about, you know, the land and um, the connection with Kanaka Maoli and with Hawaiian royalty and how you wish to honor that connection and gift. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th and thanks for those comments. Um, uh, it, let me let, let me just uh, say a little bit about the, the work in between. Um, so I, I, I left academia and I, and I moved into the field of philanthropy, and I assumed the, the, to, to be the head of the Consuelo Foundation, the largest operating foundation in the Philippines, serving over 100 non-government organizations. Um, but the, 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 the money, uh, the original gift came from uh, Consuelo Zobel de Ayala. Uh, who came from uh, the first Spanish corporation in, in the Philippines. And she uh, retired in Hawaii. She married an American general. And, and she, had, she developed an affinity for Hawaiians. And so a, a portion of the money uh, went to support Hawaiian programs as well. And, and there I learned a lot of interesting lessons as well. And I, I don't want to tell, sound too negative, but <laughs> I, I really got kind of a, a perspective on philanthropy, um, which tends to be very charity oriented and not so much social change oriented. And, and when you look at boards of major foundations around the world, uh, what you see are captains of industry and capitalism and that may not necessarily be prepared or have expertise in uh, in the area of addressing uh, the social needs of communities, uh, but certainly not prepared to uh, uh, engage in social prevention. And so that's what you have is a focus on symptoms, not root cause. And uh, the, the, the needle on social problems doesn't move. It's a feel good uh, feel. I feel it's good to, to uh, give away money. Um, you know, you become real popular when you're in a position to give away money. Everybody, Everybody's your friend. Uh, but there's a general lack of social technologies and strategies to affect social, uh, systems change. The flood gate valves of social problems never turn off. Um, and again, there's this notion that if you, if you made it in, in the business world, that you'll that you have some some knowledge about how to fix social problems, 
And that's kind of a canard that, that really is the, the two are very separate. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I never thought this would happen, but I ended up being um, at the Buddhist temple. Uh, the Hawaii Betsuin is the largest and oldest or one of the oldest Buddhist temples in Hawaii, but by far the largest. Uh, as Maya said, we're, uh, we're uh, of the sect, uh, the niche, the, the uh, Jodo Shinshu sect, uh, affiliated with the um, uh, Nishi, Nishi Honganji. And I, I also wanted to say that one of the reasons why I took this job is because my grandmother, the only grandparent that I really knew, uh, was a staunch uh, Buddhist, Jodo Shinshu Buddhist. And, you know, the, that generation uh, of Japanese, that of immigrants that came to America had, had a really rough go at it. And Buddhism was a way for her to survive, basically. It was her coping mechanism. It helped her put struggle and suffering in perspective. And uh, with that, I thought, well, maybe there's something that I can do. Maybe there's something that I can c contribute to, to the, her, you know, her, her sect of Buddhism. Um, we're, we're struggling as, as an institution, as an organization. Um, at one point in time, you know, it was the, 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 that's when the, the big white temple on the, on the Pali highway, everybody drives by it, everybody knows where it is. And, but it's, it's an institution that is kind of in many ways passe. It had its heyday and now it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, on a steep decline. Um, the, the Japanese population at one time, you know, back in the early 1900s and throughout the 19th of uh, the 20th century was the largest population in Hawaii uh, due to immigration. It was the, uh, the spiritual and cultural hub of the community. But an immigrant community is qualitatively different than an acculturated and a dispersed community, which is what the Japanese community is today. Over time, ethnic identities dilute, uh, spiritual exigencies begin to wane and coping uh, strategies change. Immigrants are no longer bound together by security and survival needs. Uh, but by human nature, people hold fast to tradition and nostalgia. They tend to live by denial and avoidance. They tend to think linearly, linearly and not ecologically. Um, but you know what? What we profess uh, is that everything is interrelated and and nothing stays the same. Uh, change and impermanence are basic Buddhist concepts. Um, so, given the de demographic shifts, the forces of socialization over time, and the secularization of society, the temple will fold as an institution unless it can develop new revenue streams, diversify its congregation and establish relevance in a contemporary context. Uh, what this means, um, and one of the challenges, is that to the extent allowable, our brand of Buddhism uh, has to become more pal palatable and attractive to a broader cross-section of people, not just Japanese and not just people of Asian descent. The temple will never again be uh, an ethnic center, but it can be a spiritual center. Uh, after the last legacy member is gone, uh, Buddhism as, as a practice uh, can still remain because its basic precepts are timeless. Um, I see Buddhist philosophy, and again, another reason why I took this job, uh, as a solution to the most daunting problems of the day, uh, which is why I took this job. Uh, Buddhism is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago, and people are discovering ways to transform rampant mindlessness produced by societal pathogens into mindfulness. Um, I tried academe as a means to shape young minds and next generation leaders, philanthropy as a way to direct the way we heal society, and now religion or spirituality as a means to get to the root cause of our problems. I think Buddhism offers a way through environmental, in, a way through environmental indifference and climate change through racial discord, greed, and social disparity. Uh, because at this point in my life journey, I've come to believe that humanity's problems are spiritually based. Uh, so as I've done before, one of the first things 
I have done since coming into this role uh, a bit over a year ago was to do some research. Uh, so I looked at membership trends over the past 20 years. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it was once the hub of the Japanese community. There were 10,000 members when it was founded in, in 1918. And today we're down to 600 members, or at least in 2022. Uh, but it's on a steep decline, so I don't, I'm not quite sure what the numbers are now. Um, which means when you look, when you calculate the numbers and you you project, you know how long we're going to last. We will not be in existence in 12 years. Uh, neighbor island temples that again were you know that were came up during the plantation era. Uh, young people have moved away. Older people have passed on, and they're closing. Um, all throughout the islands, uh, especially in rural communities, plant, formerly plantation communities. Um, anyway, I think you know one, one of the challenges that I deal with here is is uh, dealing with denial that this is not happening. People tend to find uh, tend to resort to denial uh, to deal with things that are unpleasant. Uh, we're oftentimes on the cusp of a crisis uh, without being cognizant of it. And uh, so which is why I went into the numbers and I did some calculations. Uh, and but you know, if you're in denial and and you fall asleep at the wheel, um, by the time you wake up, oftentimes it's too late. So hopefully I'm in a position now where I have some influence over the course of things where it's not too late. And, and, and really calling attention to a crisis, because I think a crisis motivates people to change, and uh, which is why I did that analysis. Um, ironically, while Buddhism is on a steep and steady decline in Hawaii, it's burgeoning on the U.S. continent. And one of the things that I did when I first came into this position was go to a conference on the future of Buddhism in America. And um, I was just, just it was such an eye-opening conference because my, my notion of Buddhism was uh, from here, from this temple. And, and from going to memorial services uh, when I was growing up at, at the Buddhist temple in Little Tokyo in LA. And I went to this conference in New York and it was, it was just mind blowing what you know what Buddhism is today in America. It was it was incredibly diverse, a large contingent of African Americans, and uh, I go, when did this happen? When did when did Black people become Buddhists? A large contingent contingent of, of of Jewish people. I go, wow, Jewish people were becoming Buddhists. Anyway, it was just you know large contingent of of indigenous people, and. Um, and then, you know, a light bulb went on as, as Maya kind of was, was leading me to talk about the land upon which our temple sits was, was gifted to us in the early 1900s by Mary Mikahala Foster, um, better known as, as the, the, the Foster Garden family, which is just kind of very close uh, in close proximity to the temple. But she was the first known Hawaiian Buddhist advisor to Queen Liliuokalani, Kalani, who, um, you know, was an incredibly courageous person to kind of go against a, you know, raised Christian, and as, you know, most Hawaiians were during that era, and, 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 and somehow, you know, the seed of Buddhism was planted, and, and she became a Buddhist, much to the chagrin of her family, and ended up gifting the land to the Honganji so that we could build this, this huge temple on the Pali. And, um, but you know, over the course of time, I'm gonna get off track a little bit, but over the course of time, there had been a number of prominent Hawaiian that followed Hawaiians, primarily Hawaiian women that followed in her footsteps, Mary Foster and Lahi Paki and Nana Viri and, and more recently, you know, I was just on a Zoom just before this meeting, Punani Burgess and Norma Wong and Manu Myers and, and um, that have really uh, 
made the connection between Buddhist precepts and Hawaiian values. And um, so we're one of the things that we're doing in, in, in our effort to diversify our congregation, because, because it's the right thing to do, but also out of necessity, is to do outreach to the Hawaiian community. Um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. And, Thank you, John. I mean, I think that there are lots of beautiful and powerful connections with many indigenous ways of seeing and being, you know, in terms of looking at our interbeing, our deep connection and reverence for land, the sense of mindfulness that is present in a lot of protocol and ceremony in led by indigenous communities all over the world, that sense of um, expansive family, that sense of... Uh, reverence and uh, spiritual essence being found all around us, right? I think that um, people are flocking to Buddhism because it's not really seen by many as so much of a religion as it is a deep philosophy and pathway to help us get through the struggles and the storms of this time and our world. I feel like there is an understanding of the pragmatic value of um, Buddhist precepts and philosophy, which I appreciate you wanting to share to build beloved community here in Hawaii and make those connections. Um, yes, uh, audience, if there is anyone who wishes to ask um, John a question, by all means do. Um, I want to ask you now, so Antipua, you know, often nourishes storytelling, and um, one of her um, stories is of that she asks uh, people to share is the story of our gift. And I'd love for you to perhaps um, share the story of uh, your gift. Um, this is not, I'm not something I um, warned you about, but I, I, I'm trying to think in your diverse uh, career um, as a philanthropist, as an academic, as an administrator, and um, as a community leader, you know, what is the gift that you feel that you have? And, you know, how has your gift threaded through all of those professions? Um, you know, what are the things that are present um, in, in your work, whether you are working with your hands, heart, mind, um, you know, that uh, you see as uh, being the most valuable in each of your endeavors? Oh, thank you for that question. That's a very good question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. So I'm, I'm going to have to kind of make it up on the spot. Um, well, you know, obviously the, the gift of ancestors, right? I, I'm, I have been able to, you know, journey back to, to the, the, the farm that where my grandmother was born in Toyama, Japan, and, um, and, and really understand what it meant to be an indigenous Japanese. They're not Ainu people from Hokkaido, but they, they worked the land for a thousand years and, um, and spent time there. And uh, everything that, that we consume came from the farm or the river that ran in, in front of the farm. And understanding that you know the, the the values that that emerge from from working the land and and being close to nature, um, I I think maybe I mean a couple of things come to mind is that I you know I've always kind of conjured up these these images of of, of how things can be, and perhaps should be, and and uh, which, which is good and bad. I mean so you know I I tend to have a vision for for things and um and and sometimes it's hard for other people to relate to that and and they think it's too idealistic or too futuristic and 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 then you get you get a lot of pushback on that because it's not how people see what's possible and and or it's too far-fetched to even figure out a way to get there 
And, uh, but I've, I've always kind of had visions about stuff. And, and then, the, 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 but the other part of that, I think to make it happen is, is relationships. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just kind of social by nature. I don't know. And, and, I've, and I've, I've had a lot of, lot of diverse life experiences. So I'm comfortable with people. Um, and I'm comfortable talking to people and asking people for stuff because it's not for me. It's, it's, it's really for, you know, the vision that, that, that I've developed. So, uh, but, but, you know, to be able to get, be able to get people to, to support you, you have to have a clear and, and well-articulated vision, a reason why, and a means to get there. And, uh, Anyway, I'm, you know, I, I suppose if, if, if I, um, those are some of the qualities that I possess and modestly speaking, I, I just, you know, I, and, and, you know, I, I'm not afraid of stuff. I mean, a lot of, so many people are risk adverse and I, and I'm like, Hey, you know, and that's where Buddhism helps me. Like, you know, everything's impermanent. Um, everything changes. Uh, life, life is, is so temporal. So you cannot be afraid of stuff. You just got to go for stuff. And, and that's, that's kind of how I see things. Thank you. Yes, you, your spiritual path gives you that equanimity and that ease and acceptance um, that enables you probably to receive the gifts of the ancestors and to hone your own and to be a good ancestor yourself. I um, have a question here in the chat and asks, in your eyes, what factors would make a Buddhist temple successful in today's society? Is it not enough to be a place open to anyone in the community? Um, what is your metrics for success? Um, yeah, well, you know, just on a practical level, every place that I've gone, you know, where I've been in a, in a leadership role, uh, I, I've, I've done a, a strategic plan. And it, it, a strategic plan is a very strategic way to get people on board and, and to work collectively and, and, and move in the same direction. And it, especially useful when you haven't had a plan for a long time, within five years. And... Um, so we we just we did, went through a plan uh, recently, and uh, you know as you can imagine in, in in most organizations that are undergoing transition, ideas about what we need to do are all over the the the, the all over space. There you know there there's not not a consensus as to what we should be doing and how and and uh, but we're at this crossroads and. Um, again, the, the you know our our congregation, as uh, most congregate, most all congregations, not only in Hawaii but on the continent as well, within the the Hompa Honganji system, have been primarily Japanese, and and the Japanese community is just not there anymore. So out of necessity and and out of um, just the, again the right thing to do, there has to be outreach to other communities uh you know one thing along with outreach to hawaiians is um we we you know the the lgbtqia plus community is under siege in in certain regions of the country and and you know a lot of them have been lifelong members of certain certain um congregations and they're being ostracized now not only by their congregations, but by their political bodies in, in, in their states. And I see this, this great opportunity to, to do outreach to the LGBTQIA community. Um, and and we're, you know, we, I call the meeting for people that might be interested. So we're gonna meet next week and we're gonna figure out really, while, while they're being pushed out of certain congregations, our, our, our our order really needs to open ourselves up to and walk because it's an order of non-judgmentalism. It's an order of welcoming people uh, from all walks of life. And uh, so, you know, there's this kind of push-pull dynamic that, that I think we need to uh, begin to practice. Um, and, you know, that doesn't always sit well with uh, 
you know, um, the conservative elements of, of the, the Buddhist um, temple. And, but again, it, you know, it's like, it's the right thing to do. It's it just, this is what we preach at, you know, at our temple and, 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 and we cannot just preach it. We have to practice it and we have to be deliberate about, about opening ourselves up to, to, to social elements that have traditionally not been a part of our order. So, um, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines and, and I, I think there, there are, you know, there are, um, there are groups, ethnic enclaves, if you will, that for historical reasons were, you know, were converted in a massive way to, to, you know, in, in Hawaii to become Christian. And, and, you know, the, the, the Philippines is 90% Catholic. And, but as people come of age and people begin to look around and they're not on auto drive anymore, and they're not being, you know, indoctrinated in the same way. And they, and they're inherently spiritual. They're, they're finding that maybe there's, 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 uh, um, you know, other orientations uh, they have a greater affinity for. And, and so, um, we have a we have a Filipino minister, Buddhist minister here, and I've been talking. We we need we need to let people know that that we're open to to other ethnicities, and and I think you know part of it is coming from the Philippines, and and you know, the the Catholic Church in the Philippines is really strong and very power, very politically um, entrenched, and and but you know. Um, but they come to Hawaii, and, and it's now the largest ethnic community in Hawaii. And, and I think things begin to relax a bit, and they begin to look at options. And, and I think we can do outreach there as well. So it, a lot of it is just like getting on the radar screen. Hey, you know, there's, there's other options out there, as well as, you know, making people feel welcome. And, and along with that is... We, we really have to diversify our income streams. We, you know, we, we've been a membership driven organization since our inception, and we really have to do other things to generate revenue. If we have, if we're able to uh, have a larger corpus, we're able to, to launch different kinds of programs to draw people in. Thank you. Can I ask you to, um... First of all, you know, greatly appreciate your orientation towards justice and real diversity and inclusion. And I know that that is not easy as you balance the needs and expectations of those who are more traditional, who have been there uh, for some time. Uh, can I ask you to please talk a little bit about, you know, the value of um, intergenerational duet um, and you know, what you think that the various generations uh, have to teach one another and how, you know, you think we can foster a sense of collective ownership and participation as we look more broadly at diversification of um, our institutions and um, efforts. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really, a challenge here, and and it's again, it's not just the Buddhist temple. It, it's it's all churches are challenged um, that that young people are not are not drawn to to organize religion, um, and so the the congregations are comprised mainly of older people, and uh, you know, I, I, well well covered stories in Hawaii that that these churches that have been mainstays are beginning to close because they just can't make it financially. And um, so the, the, you know, the, the task at hand, I think, is to, while we, while we have this core of older people, is to say, you know, what's important here? And, and, and let's begin to kind of loosen our, our you know, our grip on, on these, you know, tradition, some of these traditions to, to, begin to attract and make more palatable um, you know what what we do at this temple and to attract younger people and um, because 
you know, the younger people aren't coming to church anymore. They're not coming to the temple. Uh, they're, they're, they're taking their kids to soccer. They're, you know, they're going to the beach. They're recreating on weekends. And, and a lot of it just has to do with lifestyle. People don't have discretionary time anymore. And, and they're choosing not to come to church on their discretionary time. So um, how do we, at the same time, I think, you know, our edge is that people are kind of spiritually lost. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for grounding. And, and if, if we can bring relevance to, to, to their, their life ways, and when they're totally consumed by work and, and getting involved in things that, that really don't bring meaning or purpose, then perhaps the temple can, can ground them and bring that meaning and purpose to them. So there, there is this rift between generations. Um, and I think that what that's going to require is for us to, to better articulate and, and, and make more relevant uh, what we do here to attract younger people back, not just younger people, but a more diverse set of people. Thank you. And I think that that acceptance and true spirit of inclusion will be a big part of what draws the younger people. You know, I do think that that will lead uh, to a greater sense of trust because young people are so inclined these days to accept so many different ways of being and fluidity of identity and sexuality and gender. So I think that um, once um, our spiritual institutions can practice deep acceptance, that that will lead to the trust that is required. So I wish you luck on that journey and endeavor. We have one more question um, to close. Um, besides Hawaii, is there anywhere in the United States or other countries where many different groups of people really click, blend, accept each other, get along well with each other with regards to race and religion in your experience and observation? I, I yeah, I think there are, uh, you, you know, I'm, um... I, I think Hawaii is kind of the leader. I mean, you know, the rest of the world's catching up to Hawaii. We're, we're thought leaders in so many ways without even realizing that we are. You know, we're, we're a microcosm of the world. We, we're the most multicultural place on earth and the rest of the world's becoming multicultural. And, and so we need, to, we need to grab that and say, hey, you know, we are the vanguard of, of you know, social development and, and human development. And, and um because because we're so small, you know, we we're we're this we're this microcosm. We can see things very clearly. And, and the work that I, I used to do at, at UH, like you understand community, political, environmental, cultural, indigenous dynamics because it's all there. And 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 you know, uh, around land use issues, ar around whether or not to put up another mega resort versus you know keeping a. a you know, a sacred place and, and allowing, you know, people to practice their, their, their traditional, uh, their ways. And, uh, but I'm not answering the question. I know, but, uh, you know, there, there are uh, any place around the world, uh, Puerto Rico, or, you know, where, where there has been this convergence of cultures and people, and they figured out ways to get along. They figured out how to share their food. And, and, and of course, you know, at least to, miscegenation. I mean, people marry each other. You know, my kids are Hawaiian, Filipino, Spanish, Japanese. It's just, and, and it's just kind of the way things are in Hawaii. And, and, and you know, and if, if you're all those things, then, then, then you're not likely to be prejudiced towards anybody. Or, or if you are, it's kind of in a humorous way. And with an, there's an affectionate, you know, part to that. And, and it's not, it's not the, the cutting, you know, negative stuff that, I mean, it's Frank de Lima humor, for example, versus, you know, people that really don't understand um, this place and the people here. Thank you. I um, unfortunately find myself at the end of our hour together. And so uh, grateful for your time and grateful for your questions. I am hopeful that uh, your Betsuin will succeed and that your efforts will lead to a flourishing space of welcoming connection. And I um, 
thank you for your insights uh, that will hopefully be helpful to our students and surely um, have been interesting to our listeners today. I um, uh, want to just ask you to close with any final thoughts that you wish to share and then we bid you aloha. Uh, no, I, I just thank you all for attending. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, um, to be here. And uh, hopefully I was able to say some things that, that might have, um, you know, spurred your thinking. Uh, thank you to the Matsunaga Peace Institute for inviting me. It's really an honor to, be, to have this opportunity and to share some of my experiences and perspectives. Well, we appreciate you greatly, John, your forever family. Aloha, everyone. Thanks for being here and um, see you around another corner. Mahalo. Yeah.